Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. I'm Travis Shaddix. Thanks for joining me. I see we have a few people who are burning the candle at both ends, both at the GIE and here. I'm not sure how you're pulling that off, but I'm glad you're able to do that. Kentucky has uh, been gray and cold and wet for like four straight days, at least here in Lexington. And today, I guess, is at the GIE, you could picked a good day because it's now sunny. I hope it's sunny over in Louisville. The next couple of days is going to be sunny, so I hope the outdoor expo there is going to be going to be good. So we've been going over, we're going to get into this paper pretty quick because um, there's a lot to go over and I want to make sure we have time to do it. We've been going over cool season long for fall fertility. We've been talking about the potential risks that existed in the early 30s and 40s that they diagnosed. And then as we moved into the 60s and 70s, we started to see there really wasn't the risk of winter kill from those late fall applications of nitrogen. We've been showing that the literature is indicating that there's very little growth from soluble nitrogen applied late in the fall or winter, but some color responses late in the fall and winter. And we've touched base a little bit on nitrogen sources. There was a paper we discussed where there was ammonium nitrate versus UF. I don't know if there was another paper in there or not that talked about differences among nitrogen sources. Um, we're going to today. We've been mostly in Virginia, in Rhode Island. There might have been a Connecticut paper in there somewhere, Wisconsin, Iowa. We've been mostly on the cent central and eastern side of the United States. And today we're going to discuss a paper that goes over into the western United States and it talks about nitrogen sources. Today we have a wonderful guest who um, left a big void in academia whenever he left and went to um, went to the industry. He, we, we lost a good one in Dr. Eric Miltner. Eric, how are you today? Great, Travis. Thanks. Kind words, man. I didn't know I uh, left, left, left the void. I appreciate that. Well, if you look at the papers you did, by the, um, by the way, the real, well, this is a great paper. Obviously, I'm, we're talking about it. There's another paper that's equally fascinating to me is the, is the nitrogen fate paper that you did. I think it was actually a little bit before this one. You might have done two. I don't remember. But I, at some point, I'd like to, we're going to move into the nitrogen fate stuff. And I really, I would like to talk to you about that paper at some point as well. But, but we uh, in academia oftentimes have, have casualties and they, the, the, the faculty decide to, uh, take their, their career in a different direction, which is probably wise and they leave. And we, when we, when we see that happen, I'm like, Oh man, he was so good. <laughs> we, we rarely lose the, the ones that aren't really, really good. <laughs> and so, and so you've, you've been in the industry now for, for quite a while. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing nowadays. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, the, I, I spent about 18 years in, in university systems, you know, in turf grass re research extension education and, uh, had, had a lot of, had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, I think did some productive things and then, uh, it was just time for change. You know, it's like anything, the way universities operate change, the university politics and everybody faces a different story. But I just decided it was something different. I was uh, ready for something different. But anyway, I uh, uh, my first job uh, out of graduate school was at Utah State University, and I was the, the first person uh, hired there specifically in turf grass. Um, spent a few years there, and then and then went on to Washington State University. Um, I, I worked the Washington WSU's main campus was in Pullman, which is in the eastern part of the state, almost on the Idaho border. Uh, but I worked at a research and extension center that was essentially in the metro Seattle Tacoma area. And, you know, that's kind of a unique experience because a lot of people who work in turf work at the land grant universities, you know, that are generally out in the in the more agricultural areas. And this was an opportunity to to be a turf guy working where all the turf was, you know, and where all the where all the turf managers were. So it was a, it was it was an interesting opportunity to me. Yeah, that yeah. was in Pullman. No, I was in Puyallup, so Puyallup, which, is, Puyallup. which is about which is about thirty miles south of Seattle. Okay, so yeah. and, and I have a friend from Seattle. I spent several weeks there once with him, and to this day I can't pronounce that that city. <laughs> it's you pronounce it Puyallup. Pu Puyallup, yeah. Puyallup. I, I yeah, like there's it. lots of old, you know, um, you know, Native American names around there for mm -hmm. lots of 
lots of towns and mountains and everything else. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm from Oklahoma. So a lot, my hometown is Shawnee. So it's a, shot, yeah, there you, know. you go. So it's, wow. I'm used to the native American and I figured yeah. that I'm like, man, I, I don't want to mispronounce that word. I don't want to disrespect yeah. anybody oh. or any city, but I was like, man, I, I can't yeah. ever remember how to pronounce that pew wallop. No, yeah. good, good. Well, thanks for the introduction. So you at, at Washington state did some work on uh, late fall and winter fertility, which is exactly the topic we've been going over. And you did it in Puyallup and Pullman. And mm -hmm. um, the paper we're going to go over today is that paper. The title is Late Fall and Winter Nitrogen Fertilizations of Turf Grass in Two Pacific Northwest Climates. Now, this is an open access paper now. I'm not sure if it, if, if it was when it was originally published, but Hort Science and the American Society of Horticultural Sciences, at, I guess it's ashs.org, if I remember correctly, is the website. You can go and download this paper for free. Look at all the data till your heart's content. Um, and it was published in 2004. Now, like I, as you mentioned, or as, I'm, as it has been mentioned, is that the you've done several work, in several projects with nitrogen source and rates, and um, I think you even did some N15 work here and there. Mm -hmm. This particular paper looks at in sources at two locations. Do you mind just kind of walking us through? Um, the project in terms of how it began, what spurred the interest in doing this project and uh, kind of just more or less kind of give us a general idea of the introduction of the paper. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, so number one, I, for a long time, as long as I've been in turf, I've been a, a proponent of fall and late fall fertilization of, of cool season grasses. And, and, that, and, and, you know, my interest to that actually goes back to um, my graduate work. I, I went, I got my PhD at Michigan State University, and you mentioned the NFATE paper. Um, and what I did there, I was looking at, you know, during that time, you know, late 80s, early 90s, um, late fall fertilization was a, was a pretty popular practice there in growing. And so um, we knew that turf responded well to late fall fertilization. And when I say late fall in that geography, you know, we're talking late October to mid November. Um, but we wondered about the fate of that nitrogen, what happens to it. So we set up a study to look at that in Michigan and, and um, found out that um, actually the, you know, the, that fate data was quite, favorable and maybe one day we'll be able to talk about that in detail but so i kind of cut my teeth on late fall fertilization there a um, couple jobs later i found myself in western washington and um so you know really all the work in late fall fertilization for the most part was done in similar climates a lot of it in the midwest or the northeast where you have truly cold freezing winters and they had that kind of winter in pullman at, at the main campus but the Metro Seattle Tacoma area and all the way down, you know, the West Coast, all the way down to San Francisco has similar climates that, you know, Mediterranean climate that's, that's kind of governed by the Pacific Ocean just to the West. And even though we were at like 47 degrees north latitude, which is even farther north than East Lansing, Michigan, uh, by quite a bit, um, we didn't really have, you know, cold freezing winters. So it wasn't like a Midwest winter. And we began to wonder, well, uh, is there a difference in late fall fertilization in a, in a, in a climate like that, in a cool Mediterranean climate versus, you know, most of the rest of the swath of the northern of the northern U.S.? And so and so that's why we're interested in looking at it. And so I had a, a colleague in Pullman, uh, Dr. Bill Johnston, who was there for a long, long time um, since passed away, sadly, a few years ago. But um, so, you know. He was there in Pullman and was a great cooperator, and I was in Puyallup, and so we were able to put together a study to kind of compare those two climates and and what difference did that make in terms of late fall fertilization. Nice. Well, great. Yeah. You do a really nice job on this um, third paragraph in the introduction, kind of setting the stage as to what had occurred in the past, basically what you've just said, what, what has occurred in the past and sort of what was done it really wasn't done in the climates that you were working in at that point. Um, and let me just kind of point out one or two comments. I think I can draw on this. We, you, know, you and I were having difficulties with this PDF earlier. I think I got it now where I can do some stuff. 
the biggest potential drawback of late fall in uh, application reported in the literature was decreased freezing tolerance of Kentucky bluegrass measured in the laboratory. Now, we went over the Wilkinson and Duff paper as we did the Carroll 39 and 43 paper. And I've made a point of communicating to my uh, audience that what we find in the, the lab or freeze chambers can oftentimes be um, taken into the field and we see something similar, but oftentimes we don't. Um, and you set the stage by saying this is what the drawback has been by these late fall fertility papers, but they were done in the lab, you know, and, there, uh, and so it is what it is. Um, I know Powell found that we didn't see much damage at all in the field um, that was previously, I don't know, predicted or anticipated in these laboratory studies. He didn't see that damage. Other researchers have reported the same, where they just don't see that winter kill damage from late fall fertility. And you set the stage by saying essentially that. Um, I just want to finish this paragraph of the introduction because I like this paragraph. There is also concern about applying fertilizer at this time could lead to nitrate leaching. And then you have your paper here, 96, observed that 0.1% of November applica- applied urea nitrogen leached through sandy soils. And it says, even so, most recommendations include the use of slow release in sources at an added safety measure. So that, to me, those two, three sentences there, this is what has occurred. This was sort of the thought, the, the risk or the presupposed um, concern um, potential death, potential winter kill, potential leaching. And so we've, we've included in our recommendations, and at least at this point, when you wrote this paper, some slow release materials to kind of, you know, as a safety net sort of thing, which I could, you know, go, we can go down that road at some point. Uh, and so that, and that's what brings us to this paper is that you, you looked at these slow release materials in these settings, as well as the soluble materials in these settings. Um, so with that, I just want to finish the objective. Then I want you to go, we'll go in and explain exactly what you did. So there were two objectives in this research um, project to compare plant response to fall applied nitrogen in the, in the mild winter climate of Western Washington and the colder winter climate of Eastern Washington, and to assess the effectiveness of January and February in applications in Western Washington. So there was two objectives, but basically you're looking at nitrogen source responses in these two different locations. Do you want to kind of go through if, and as, as long as I did that justice and you don't want to add anything to it. Do you want to go through and explain what it is you did in you know the whole the whole process, basically the materials and methods? Sure. The, you know the only thing I'll add to it in those objectives you mentioned was that part about affecting this the January and February applications in Western Washington, hmm. and 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 that might sound you know strange to people. Why would you fertilize then? Well, it's a very mild winter climate, and um, you know depending on the year. Um, you know, most years you could say we have an 11 month growing season, maybe even 12 month in a milder winter. And it wasn't uncommon to see people fertilizing, you know, in, in any month in Western Washington. Okay. That low doses. So we wanted to see if that really made sense because even though, you know, we weren't frozen or snow covered, mm-hmm. um, we know the plant slows down. It's, 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 it's chilly and the plant slows down under those conditions. So we wanted to look specifically at applications right in the dead of winter now i mean if i may interject just briefly did you ever do any because that's pretty common where we see um soluble or nitrogen applications in general occur when it's not frozen you know there, there's a little bit of color response oftentimes did you ever mm-hmm. do any work on um in fate during those times on any of your previous papers or any any papers you've done like what happens so the, to the end? The the the, the two thousand the, the the ninety six paper that you studied that came from my dissertation research, and and we applied N fifteen labeled urea in November, okay, in Michigan in East Lansing, Michigan, okay, and 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 what and, and so actually what we did is we 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 compared applying it in November to applying it in April, okay, right, um, both you know cooler months where the plant is relatively slow and and what we found we actually found greater utilization of the nitrogen applied in november Mm -hmm. than the nitrogen applied in april okay and essentially no leaching so um you know when we when when we think about the late fall and and what's happening to the plant we know the plant is shutting down growth on the top slows down but as those temperatures drop uh the soil still holds a lot of heat. So the soil, the soil cools more slowly than the air temperature. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening physiologically in the plant is we can apply fertilizer at that time. We might not see a big growth response, may or may not see a color response, but the roots are still active. 
long, you know, later into the year than the than the shoot portions of the plant. And so they can still take up some nutrients. And I think I think what happens is it takes them up and it kind of stores them in the plant. Okay. You get some plant response, but it kind of stores it there. And then that 96 paper would indicate when things warm up in the spring, the nutrients are there and the plant, the plant can utilize them when growing conditions get good. Okay. So the, the, the take home message there is that even the nitrogen that was applied in November that sat there all winter, uh, it didn't move off site essentially is what you found. Uh, in, in this case, actually what happened, what we found in that, in that 96 paper was mm -hmm. that a, 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 a lot of it, not necessarily sticking around in the soil. A lot of it is taken up in the plant. Okay. And it was, it was in the plant and just sitting there, okay. you know, waiting for conditions. But I think the, the, the current paper that we're talking about today, you'll probably also see some evidence that yeah. some of it is sticking around in the soil. All right. Yeah. Thanks for redirecting me. I was just more curious because I haven't gone over that paper yet and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I know, um, Soldat did another paper, um, where he looked at the a similar thing. And so those, those papers are in my catalog, uh, um, mm -hmm. stash. And I'm, when I get to the in fate, you know, stuff I'm, I've been going over the Eric, I've been going over this cool season stuff for like, well, the guys can, I don't know, two or three weeks. And it doesn't seem to end. It's just all fall for chili of cool season grasses. And you know how it is when you start going down the rabbit hole of literature review, you just keep going no. and going and going. And, yeah. you know, and I, I guess what I'm trying to do is just show people that it's not one paper or two papers or three. It is many, many, many papers. And occasionally you have some disagreement in the papers occasionally. But the, the, the overarching or overwhelming amount of information is showing that fall fertility uh, it can be beneficial. It's not particularly harmful. Um, it's just when to do it at your location can, you know, how do you be most effective at it? So, okay. Yeah. Sorry. But back on, back on track. Yeah. Um, so I know you did this at two locations over two years. Why don't you walk us through and kind of explain what it is you did? Yeah. So, you know, I'd like to step back from it and talk about sort of a big picture concept that's become more popular in recent years. Uh, and it's, and, and we refer to it as the four R's of nutrient stewardship. Okay. And, 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 and some of you may have heard of that, but those four R's are applying the right source at the right rate at the right time in the right place. And, and so this, this kind of study, um, looks at, looks at a couple of those things. It's looking at right source and mm -hmm. right time. And I think when you think about that concept in setting up your, your nutrient, you know, management plan, um, you know, it implies that there are there are a lot of different ways that you can do it and do it right as long as you consider all those factors. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what this paper addresses. So and this was before we talked about four R's. Right. Um, so, you know, what we did. So we have these two locations, one of them, uh, Pullman, Washington, you would you know, would be similar to any uh, Midwestern climate across most of the U.S. where most of that other work was done. And yep. then we have Puyallup, which is this cooler Mediterranean climate. And um, at the Puyallup I have in there is uh, the USDA hardiness zone 8A, which uh, is is actually uh, pretty similar to Atlanta, where I live now. Okay, um, okay. Those plant hardiness zones are based on uh, like the coldest winter temperatures. Yeah. So they don't really take, take into account heat during the summer. Um, because it's based on plant hardiness, you know, what, what you can survive. So, so you can see there's a difference of two whole hardiness zones between Puyallup and Pullman, which is significant. I forget what that is on a, from a temperature standpoint. Mm. Um, but that's a, but that's a significant difference. We're in, we're in two very different climates. Yes. Um, and so what we did is we, we looked at, um, several different fertilizer sources. Uh, we used ammonium sulfate. That was a very popular soluble end source in in washington mm -hmm. um i think you would see similar results from urea it just happened to be the one that was more popular locally yes uh, we had a polymer coated sulfur coated urea uh, we had a polymer coated urea and then the last one was was ibdu isobutylidine diurea and some of you may remember ibdu may it rest in peace um <laughs> And, uh, you know, IBDU was a really popular source out there also. It's a, it's a slow release source mm -hmm. um, and um, very popular in that area. Um, what happened to IBDU is we, it, it's not produced in North America anymore because it just became too expensive to produce and yeah. people wouldn't buy it at the market price. 
I think uh, there are still some made in in Europe. I think in Germany, and there's probably some made in China. I don't know, but but you know, import fees make it prohibitive. So we don't really have access to IBDU anymore. Um, but back at this, you know, when this study was done, it was it was a popular source. Yeah. Well, first of all, one thanks for putting the hardiness information in there because I rarely see that in scientific journals. And but th- what that does for the average person is it allows them to immediately compare a little bit. Maybe it's not exactly a good comparison, but it's close as we can get with their area. So when I have questions about, well, I'm in Southern Texas or I'm in Pennsylvania or whatever, well, with these hardiness zone information, you can get a good idea as to whether or not this is relative or closely relative to the environment that you're in. You have two different regions or two different zones. Um, So thank you for doing that. I, I, I wish, I don't know if it's appropriate in some other journals or not, but I'm glad it was in this journal. So you have two locations. You ha- at the Puyallup location, you, you have two different grasses too, actually. So in the Puyallup, you in, I think it was perennial rye. Was it? Yep, uh, perennial yeah, perennial rye grass. Where, oh, yeah, so somewhere in here you have it. Perennial rye at Puyallup. And in the Pullman, you used uh, Kentucky bluegrass. So we're dealing with two locations, one grass at one location, a different grass at another location. We're dealing with four, five, I think it's five different end sources. We have ammonium sulfate. This is the old tricoat from... Yep. I, I guess this was Purcell making that, or I don't know who was making yep. that back then. And yep, then, uh, yeah, poly, they're probably making this polyon too back then. Purcell was. So we have ammonium sulfate, polymer, so sulfur coated urea, polyon, IBDU. And is that it? That's IBD, it. Yeah, that's it. So one, two, three. We have four yep. end sources. And then I, yeah. I think you have a control. And then we have an unfertilized check. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, perfect. So. You used months as a fixed. Okay, let me. By the way, I, I sometimes I digress. I go backwards and start using scientific language, and I, guys are pretty good about saying, "Hey, well, hold on." <laughs> so instead of saying, um, "Let me back up," you have months as a treatment. So November, December, January, and February as as a treatment. That's that's when um, you know you're comparing what occurred over at this month versus that month and so forth. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so, well, the, so the month is the, the, the month is um, the, the time of application, basically date of application as a treatment. Did you did you have it as a fixed effect or not? I thought you did. Let me go through here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. OK, yeah. so. Um, OK, so that's that. And now the fertilizer treatments were applied. At, it looks like a pound and a half. Yeah. OK, so each time they were applied, the, whether it's slow release or soluble, they were applied at a, mu- at a pound and a half. Yeah. So everybody knows yeah. that was the. That was the rate of application. Um, right. Let's talk about that real quick since you have a table on it. Fertilizer treatment application dates for comparison in year one and year two. So you're doing uh, the November, you're doing December, you're doing January, you're doing February, and you have slightly different dates here and there. But basically, right. that's when you're applying it in those months. And you're applying a pound and a half once in each one of those months. True? Well, well, a pound and a half in a single application. So, so like, like, so like, for instance, uh, you know, one plot would get a pound and a half of ammonium sulfate in November. Yes. A different plot would get that the ammonium sulfate applied in December. Okay. Yes. Okay. So each plot was only was only fertilized one time. Yes. So the objective was was to look at what happens when we apply each of these fertilizers in November? What's the impact in the winter and the spring? But okay. what if we wait and divide it and apply them in December? Then then what do we see? Yeah, okay, perfect. Right. Yep. So you did, uh, we'll go into some of the variables you measured. I, and I, I like this sentence. I've never read this sentence in a, in a scientific paper, so I underlined the, the next sentence. So visual quality ratings were recorded monthly, okay. Um, and you did the scale of one to nine, with so five was acceptable. So when we're looking through these data, guys and gals, anything five or greater was considered acceptable. But the sentence that I like is all ratings were conducted by the same person. Now I've tried to explain this to, to, to people that blocking, and I'm gonna get a little statistics here. I don't, I don't mean to to go too far from left field and lose my audience, but whenever we do blocks often in, 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 in grad school, we learn, Oh, you're going to do a randomized complete, you're going to a randomized complete block design. You're going to block it down the, the known variation that exists, whether it's light or water or whatever the case is. But really, I think the human factor probably pre- it presents more error into the study than any of the, you know, environmental factors, because you have a human being measuring the treatments, 
measuring the nitrogen, measuring the, the, the clipping weights, running the, the data in the, on the instruments or whatever the case is. And when we take ratings, if I go out and take a rating, my grad student better be calibrated to me, not just off doing their own ratings and what they think the rating is, because otherwise the, the numbers are going to be all over creation. So I've never actually read this. All ratings were conducted by the same person, which is exactly what I would hope would occur in every study. Oftentimes we're not able to do that. But in this case, you wrote it in there and said you did. That's I like that sentence for some reason. Yeah. So well, well done on that. The human factor is flawed. I mean, anytime a human gets involved, we just we're we just we're not as accurate as as we might think we are. And um, so yeah. that's nice that you wrote that in there. I don't know. Um you did mowing in a different way that I, I haven't ever actually done clippings this way. And I'm, I wanted, I underlined it because I wanted to ask you about it on, in one of the locations you did mowing normally where you'd, well, I say normal, what I'm used to, where you'd mow it, you'd wait for a certain set of number of days, then you'd mow it again and collect the clippings. That's what was done in, uh, that's over here, five days of growth. That was in Puyallup, I guess. But yeah. in Pullman, this, you said the plots were first mowed with a rotary mower at a height of five centimeters. The height of cut of the mower was reduced and cut at 3.8 centimeters. So you're looking at, say, I guess that's two inches and you lowered it to inch and a half or something, mm -hmm. rough, roughly. But what, I, I've never seen that before, Eric. What, 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 how does that, what, what, is that common and I, I just missed it or how does that work? No, no, no. So so this has been a long time and I have to admit, I, I don't remember why. I mean, it, it may have even been due to either um, perhaps not not super clear communication or maybe okay. some other method that that the group um, in in Pullman uses. But if you think about the impacts of that, okay, so so what we did in Puyallup might be a little more common, right, and easy to to digest. Um, we, you know, the first mowing in the spring, we're just mowing it to get rid of all the whatever junk, you know, there's probably some winter debris picked up in there and all that stuff that we don't want to interfere. <laughs> and then we come back and mow five days later, right? So we're, yeah. so we're basically looking at how much growth occurs over those five days. Uh, and that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. But if you think about really what, what was being measured in Pullman is it's all mowed at a uniform height. And then immediately after that, it's mowed at a uniform, but shorter height. Yeah. And so it's, you're really sort of measuring density, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, because the, the length of the blades you're cutting off is all the same. So if there's any difference in there, it's due to the number of grass blades in that area. Yeah. So it actually kind of turns out to being a sort of an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, no, it is. I just I never thought about doing it that way. I've never yeah. come across it. So what well, we might yeah. go into the grow, the yield or a little bit. I don't know. I'm 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 interested in the, the quality stuff, but we can go into the yield. I was yeah. just kind of curious. I underlined it's like I've never seen that before. Right. I thought I'd ask you about it. Okay, so that's basically what you did. The, the setup's pretty straightforward. We have two locations, some nitrogen sources. We have different months. Uh, we measure quality. We measured yield. Let's uh, uh, For those people, I actually got a question the other day. I'm just going to briefly show. I'm not going to go through the temperature stuff. But I'm just going to show that the temperature is in this particular manuscript. In the early manuscripts, as you know, Eric, um, a lot of times the, the meteorological information was omitted. They didn't include it in the 30s and 40s, even in sometimes in the 60s and 70s. Now, nowadays it's standard and you can see that it's in this paper if you want to compare them. You'll see here just real briefly that the Puyallup uh, uh, location never really, the average uh, for the month, it doesn't ever get below freezing. There might be a day or two here or there, but it doesn't ever get below freezing on the average. Whereas in Pullman, we're dealing with a couple of months, December, January, they get the average gets very, very close to freezing or below freezing in, the, in both years. So we're dealing with a very cold, uh, colder climate in Pullman. The Puyallup is like, as, as Dr. Miller said, it's more of a Mediterranean climate, a little, little warmer and a little bit more uniform. The temperature fluctuation is not quite as, as uh, severe, I suppose. Okay, so let's get into the, some of the results. The first table that I want to go over is table three. This effect of four nitrogen sources applied in November, December, January, or February on turf quality in Pullman. So we're on the east coast, or the east side of Washington in the colder climates, and we're looking at year one turf quality results. We have a control, ammonium sulfate, sulfur coated urea, polymer coated urea, and IBDU. You want to kind of just walk us through the highlights of this table? Yeah, sure. So what we did, so if we look at that that first group, we start up in the top left corner, we see uh, we look at we see fertilizers uh, applied in November. Mm -hmm. And then that second column, we see the nitrogen sources. 
Um, and so as we read across that top set of data, mm -hmm. uh, we applied it in November and we took that first quality rating in December and then continued to do it uh, throughout the throughout the winter. Um, and, and so so focus on don't focus so much on the changes across months because we're really interested in the difference between those fertilizer sources applied in any single month. Right. OK. OK. So. So we want to focus on we want to focus and compare things vertically, if you will. OK. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we see there under that column that says December, uh, we can see the control with no fertilizer, a quality of five. And we can see, you know, somewhat of a response from any source that was applied. Yep. OK. You know, the biggest response was from ammonium sulfate. That makes sense. It's soluble. It's readily available. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty good response from the from the polymer coated sulfur coated urea, the tricoat. Yep. Um, and less of a response from the PCU and the IBDU. Yeah. So th the reason for that is because, uh, you know, slow release, slow release fertilizers. So you know, I, I should have, you know, full disclosure at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I now work for a company and have for the last 12 years that makes slow release fertilizers of all kinds of different kinds. Right. Okay. We, we make sulfur coated urea. We make polymer coated sulfur coated urea. We make polymer coated products. We make stabilized nitrogen products, which 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 many of you probably use. Um, and 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 we we're also in the methylene urea urea formaldehyde business, neutrally and nitroform brands. Many of you are familiar with. Um, we don't make those ourselves. Somebody makes them for us because that's a very specialized process. But all these slow release sources release by different mechanisms. Okay, most of them are temperature controlled to some extent. And so what we see here, we see less of a response in the month after application from the polymer coated urea and the IBDU because those have temperature is an important component of their release, especially with the PCU. Now, some people will argue that point on IBDU because they would say, I thought IBDU was released by water, which is true. But the reason it's released by water is because it's released uh, due to uh, a chemical reaction called hydrolysis, where water, as the action of water, is breaking down that chemistry and releasing the nitrogen from it. But hydrolysis is a temperature-dependent reaction. <laughs> when temperatures are colder, hydrolysis happens at a lower rate. When temperatures are warmer, hydrolysis happens more quickly. So IBDU is also a temperature-dependent fertilizer source. Um, now, if you compare that to like methylene urea, um, it's also very temperature dependent, but that's because microorganisms break that material down. We didn't have MU in this study. Um, and so it's temperature dependent for a different reason. Polymer coated urea, also temperature dependent, but for a different reason. Uh, in polymer coated urea, we, you know, we put this polymer membrane around the fertilizer and um, what happens is water soaks in through it the nutrients on the inside dissolve, and then they basically slowly weep out through that polymer membrane. Um, th this, is, this is driven by a, a, a process called diffusion, which is also temperature dependent. So under warmer temperatures, we see more diffusion from a coated urea. Um, <laughs> under cooler temperatures, less diffusion and less release. Sorry, we're really getting into the weeds here, but this no. is sort of the crux of understanding these different these different fertilizer sources. So anyway, back looking at that column of December data, what we see is the PCU and the IBDU are releasing more slowly because they're temperature dependent. Okay? Yeah, well, the turf response to those sources is uh, retarded to some degree because the release is slower than the ammonium sulfate or sulfur coats. Basically, what you're saying is that the case it, it, exactly exactly okay and you can and see the, that in january as well where the two uh the two sources the polymer code and ibdu are still a little lagging they're acceptable the turf's acceptable but they're lagging behind a little bit behind the ammonium sulfate and sulfur exactly code. and at that point in time by by january you can see those numbers fell compared to december mm -hmm. for, for, for all sources and, yeah. and you have to wonder is that well number one we have plant growth is slowing down a lot remember this is pullman washington right it's, it's it's freaking it's cold over there uh, <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> but but you also have to, to to ask yourself well was there any additional nitrogen being released from those two sources lower in the list mm -hmm. as temperatures got colder and colder or is it still just sort of living on the color response from release maybe in november and december right 
Yeah. And then as we move across the winter, we see the numbers drop because it's cold. Mm -hmm. But we see that that same trend. We see that that group of sources that that the plant responded to it. It had better winter color, and that's all because it released they released nutrients in November. Yep. Okay. okay. Now, if we move down to that second group and we look at December, okay, you see there was there was no rating done in December because we hadn't applied fertilizer yet. So then we started rating in January. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can see as we get into look at those ratings in January and February, there are no differences. Yep. Even in right? March. Yeah. So, so what that's saying is the, those nutrients that when we applied them in December, it was too cold. Uh, plant growth had slowed down too much, even for the soluble sources mm -hmm. that, you know, ammonium sulfate would have dissolved and been available in the soil. But the plant just wasn't growing anymore and taking it up. So fertilizing in December in that climate really did us no good. Okay, so now if, if, if we fast forward into the spring and start to look at April and May, mm -hmm. we see some different responses in April and May. Yep. And that indicates that those nutrient sources, at least to some extent, are sticking around through the winter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then becoming available in the spring. Now, uh, you know, we see... We do see some response from ammonium sulfate in the spring, but it's it's kind of measured. Yeah. So maybe there's a little bit, but that's still stuck around in a, in a, in a freezing winter climate. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we see the greater response from the PCSU and especially the PCU. And I want to point out that response from the PCU because you can see it's it, it, it from a from a from a December application and 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 for a November application, too. The best one in May was that polymer coated urea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what happens, and we've done a lot more work on this with our products um, since I've worked for this fertilizer manufacturer. Um, what we know is that these polymer coated fertilizers, they shut down in the winter and those nutrients just sit there. And then when it warms up in the spring, they start releasing nutrients. So, so we get into this period five or six months after application. And, and we're seeing some really, really good response from that PCU. Yeah, let me just uh, uh, add on to that a little bit here. So the PCU applied in December. Uh, so we're talking about this second to last column here, or uh, uh, row here. You see very little response from any of the nitrogen sources, and then you start to see the response in April and then in, in May. And so when you see this A, uh, this means that it's greater than any other uh, treatment that does not have an A. And so when, and I've, I've talked about this from a, um, it was, I can't remember. It was the paper done in Japan on, um, uh, on phosphorus and they talked about statistical differences, but in that paper, they concluded that this is what you should do, but there was no, biologically it was insignificant. The statistics were there, but it was biologically insignificant. But when you're dealing with a difference of a 6.8 and a 5.8, that's biologically significant. I mean, you're, you're going to very likely, or the homeowner is very likely going to know the difference when you look at a, a basically a six versus a seven. It's, you know, maybe not, you know, everyone, but more than likely that's biologically significant as well as statistically significant in this particular case. And at least in my, in my view, if this was a 6.8 and that was a 6.6 .6 and they were different statistically, I'm like, eh, you're not going to see that. But this one, you probably will. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to uh, like to mention, however, as well, is that you see that in December of the polymer coated urea. Now, this this difference that exists between the polymer coated urea and the ammonium sulfate does exist in when applied in December and when you measure it in May. But fairly regularly, the ammonium sulfate is as good or better than any other nitrogen source, except in three months in both locations. I think there's three months. For example, the A, there's an A here, an A here, and so forth. You see all these ammonium sulfate. There's an A here. There's This is where it was inferior to the polymer coated urea. But you'll see ammonium sulfate be at the top of the list pretty much at every other month. And then when we go to the next location, you're going to see something similar. In addition to that, consistently across both locations, you'll see IBDU just didn't perform well. And you, you mentioned that. About it is people think IBDU is not temperature dependent. It's it's water dependent. It is water dependent, as you mentioned. But water dependency is temperature dependent. And I, I was a little bit taken back by that finding that generally we find IBDU to perform fairly well. But you have to remember this is applied in November and December, 
in a very cold climate versus, say, applying IBDU earlier, like September or October, where it's a little bit warmer. I'm wondering, you know, I don't know if I, I don't know what I'm going with this. It just seems like we've had success with IBDU over the year in the 80s and 90s and so forth. But this paper is, is one of the few, few papers I've seen where IBDU just didn't do well at all, even in cooler climates. And so, you know, where you might think IBDU is the way to go if you still have it. Well, maybe not so much in Washington during these times, right? Yeah. It surprised me, too, because it was a you know very popular source out there, especially west of the Cascades. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, people had used it for many, many years and, and really loved it. But in this yeah. particular study, you're right, we did not see good results. And this was over two years at two locations where we didn't see good results. So it wasn't just a fluke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can have outliers. We can have mistakes yeah. right here and there. But over two yeah. years and two locations, that those those excuses start to kind of <laughs> erode. You know, we just didn't you just didn't see it. OK, if you want to continue, continue. But you, you applied it in January, then you applied it in, in February. And for the most part, give or take. Uh, you you see a similar response from from the December applications where you just don't see much happen um, yep. until later in the spring from the slow release sources. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So so you know so you know the basic conclusion to draw from here from this data is if you want to um, if you're going to fertilize in the late fall in that kind of a climate, you know, keep it to you know early the, the first half of November, you get later than that and you're just not going to get, it's just not an efficient way to use, yeah. to use nutrients. Let, let's go to yeah. table four, because I, I'll admit my ignorance. I'm not entirely clear what I'm looking at in table four. I think I know, but since I have you on, you can kind of <laughs> correct me. Table four is the effect of four nitrogen sources on turf quality in Pullman, the same, same location in year two averaged over the, Averaged for the three months of application, November, December, January, February. What I, I don't quite help, help me understand this table, Eric. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm looking at. It's so, at, so table three is presented because there were interactions between nitrogen sources and month of application. Oh, up here. Okay, so here you yeah. just pulled them together. So, so in year two, that's the second year. There, there were there were no interactions between mm. end source and month of application. Okay, okay, that helps. Perfect. So we just looked at at the difference, uh, you know, in yeah, just averaged over months. Okay, is, is the way we presented it. I yeah. present. I've explained that a little bit in the past. Where when 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 we in science, whenever we don't have an interaction, basically what it's saying is the same thing occurred in that month versus that month versus that yes. month, or the same thing occurred in that look whatever, and we pull them together to gain more power in the study um, yeah. since there were no differences, and in this case, uh, that's what it. Okay, that, that explains. Well, help me understand. I mean, ex so uh, let's go through this just briefly. So uh, December, ammonium sulfate and polymer coat or, or sulfur coat is is are the two that stand out. They're the they're the two that were acceptable, whereas the other, the control, the polymer coat, and the IBDU did not. They all continue to decline in f January and February. The quality continues to decline, I suppose, as it gets colder. If they're all unacceptable in January and February, even though there's a difference statistically between some of these sources. They're all still unacceptable. March, they're still all unacceptable, but the the two, the sulfur coat and the ammonium sulfate stand out. And then in April is when we finally get to the point where the nitrogen sources are resulting in acceptable turf grass. And all the nitrogen sources resulted in acceptable turf grass, but some of them differed from others in terms of their magnitude of response. True? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the ammonium sulfate is a 7.3 versus a sulfur coat. Now we're looking at, well, 6.7 versus 6.4 is probably not biological, but I mean, but we're looking at some pretty big differences between the high and low 7.3 versus IBDU at 5.3. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, you're going to see that out there. You're going to see different squares when you're out there looking at those, those turf plots, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be highly visible. I mean, two, two quality points. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a big difference. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to the quality at the next location, unless there's something about the yield or the results that you want to cover from, from Pullman. No, okay. no that's fine. Um, I, the question in chat is, is the, ta is table four April response due to a sulfur deficiency? Table four, is it due to a sulfur deficiency? So is this, is this, there's a, 
I'm, I'm writing a paper now, Eric, on sulfur deficiency in turf grass, where we finally got a location where, you know, so I've been talking about sulfur deficiencies in the, the, in the absence of sulfur, nitrogen just cannot be metabolized. And so my audience is a little bit familiar with the importance of having sulfur, especially today, since we've cleaned up a lot of the air quality issues in our industrial processes. So this has sulfur, this uh, sulfur coated urea has sulfur, but the polymer coated urea does not have sulfur. So my right. answer to that question, um, Eric, would to Lush in the, in the chat is, is the response due to sulfur? I would say probably not because of the polymer coated urea response. The polymer coated urea did not have sulfur and it still, ha still had a response. The, the only question would be the difference between polymer coat and ammonium sulfate. The difference between these two, is it due to sulfur? I don't know. Eric, do you have any comment on that? I would I would tend to think not, but there's but there's a possibility that there's some contribution. I mean, remember ammonium sulfate is 24% sulfur, yeah. it's 21% nitrogen. We're applying more S than than we're applying N, right? True. Um, that polymer coated sulfur coated urea. Let's see, that was a 43. So that's probably about seven percent sulfur. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's probably about four percent sulfur. Okay. So, so, so a very small amount of sulfur. Uh, in fact, probably, you know, an agronomically insignificant amount of sulfur. Most likely, yeah. I don't. I don't know what the sulfur level were in your soils. Um, uh, who knows? Uh, it's possible, Lush, in the chat. It's possible it could be a result of sulfur. Um, the answer is. I don't know. We, we we don't know. But I'd have to know what the original sulfur levels were in the soil to kind of have a general idea. Yeah. If they're anywhere above 10 parts million malic 3, then very likely not. If it's in the single digits on malic 3 sulfur, it's the likelihood becomes greater and greater that it could sulfur could have had a beneficial, um, you know, could have been a response to partially at least the sulfur. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's go to the quality in Puyallup. I said it right, Puyallup. I think I said it right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything uh, uh, significant difference or any points that you want to go over in the quality from the other location? So, um, you know, what we saw, if we look at the December application, the, the data is really kind of similar to what we saw from a December application in, in Pullman in a, in a colder climate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we saw, we saw, you know, response from everything a better response from ammonium sulfate and PCSCU than the others. So not, not a huge surprise there, but here's where the difference comes in. If we, if we start to move down the table and we look at a December application, we do see significant responses in January from a December application. If we remember in Pullman, once we got to a December application, we saw no response through the winter. Okay. Right. Yep. Plant was shut down. Fertilizers maybe were sort of shut down release. But, but in Puyallup, because of milder climate, we can apply in December and still get plant response through the winter. And then we still, we carrying through, we see similar responses in the spring where, mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, PCU, you know, generally looks, you know, pretty good still coming out into the spring. We get a little bit of better response from IBDU in Puyallup maybe than we okay. did in Pullman. Yep. But the kind of the same general trend continues, but this was, this was kind of the, the, the crux of it. I mean, even, even if we apply, um, in, in January, we didn't really see much of a response in February, but we did, we did in March. So, but, okay. but the main point here is that in that more moderate climate of Western Washington, we can apply fertilizer into December and still get effective nutrient use and effective plant response. So we can go a month later yeah. and that's kind of, that's kind of the whole point of the study. That's what we were shooting for. Okay. How late can we go? Is the climate mild enough that we can go later? And what if we apply in January and February, which some people do, we see January, maybe that's not great because we see no significant response in February. Yeah. But when we go to that last group in the table applied in February, right away, we see responses in March. So again, yeah. in that milder climate, it's already starting to warm up in February. Plants are growing, nutrients available, and the plants are going to take them up. So okay. if I were managing turf west of the Cascade Mountains, you know, maybe the only month that, 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 that really isn't a, a, an efficient time to fertilize or, or, or the least efficient time to fertilize would be in January. Okay. Right. And it makes sense. It's the dead of winter, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it's it's still it's still pretty chilly there, even though it's milder than we are across similar latitudes across the rest of the the rest of the continent. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So basically, as we move further west, where it's warmer, the the, the I'm going to call it the critical ap- application deadline, if you want to call it that. You yeah. can actually do it in December and still ha- there's some evidence to support applications in December, I suppose. Yeah. Whereas in the eastern yeah. part of Washington, you're looking at no later than November. November is the time you want to apply it, not, not anything later than November. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah. And, and as a, and this is as a result of the cooler climates. The, the temperatures are, are much colder in the eastern part of Washington. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I underlined a few things. I think he kind of already went over those. Uh, yeah, you basically just summed it up. Everything that I underlined, basically, <laughs> you you uh, you mentioned, which is what I'm what I was hoping for. Now, these exp- right here, the experiments indicate that late fall in fertilization in Pullman should take place no later than November. Okay, so this for the for the people who may not be as you know in, in the scientific world per se. I mean, the, this is how BMPs are generated by people going out and doing the work that Dr. Milner did, and we're finding okay in this month. You know, we, you know, golf course has you know nationwide BMPs. Well, the BMP for Washington is going to be very different than the BMP for this, this you know, for Kentucky, for example. And it's because mm-hmm. of work like this, where we know we can, we have evidence to support applications um, later into the, the the fall, early in the winter, on Western Washington as opposed to Eastern Washington. Those same BMPs wouldn't work in Iowa. Right. <laughs> so th- this is why we do this work. This is why we have the BMPs that we do from from work like this. So, yeah, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have something? No, no, no. That's uh, that's perfect. Yeah. So warmer temperatures in Puyallup coincide with extended in fertilization window compared to Pullman. Pretty straightforward, simple. I like like simple sentences. November yeah. and December were both effective fertilization application times to enhance winter turf grass quality in Puyallup. Ammonium sulfate and sulfur coated urea resulted in a positive quality response in December that lasted into the spring. So although the response to polymer coat was not quite as rapid, there was a more extended response into May. So you don't see that early response from the polymer coats. And oftentimes in, in the world of blending, oftentimes we can blend these things in a way that gives us a little bit of soluble mm-hmm. in, either from urea or ammonium sulfate in the blend with polymer coat mm-hmm. to give you a you know a tenth of a pound or a quarter pound of soluble in along with the polymer coat. So sometimes that that lag response from the early up from the early times after polymer coat's been applied, you can sometimes work through that if you by applying having your blender blend in a little bit of soluble in into that that blend sometimes that that kind of helps that slow release um yep. that slow response i should say kind of overcome that a little bit yeah uh, at least that's that was my strategy when i was in the in the industry yeah absolutely yeah use use the soluble in to kind of fill in that lag at the beginning yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, go ahead so i want to if I can, I'd like to add to this a little bit based on, so this paper's 20 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, s- since then, uh, since going to work for a fertilizer manufacturer, um, I've learned a lot more about how these fertilizers work and how they're built. And and, and I just like to, to add some additional recommendations based on that. Not necessarily supported by a lot of hard data, mm-hmm. but based on, you know, just observations in the field. Okay. Um, number one, from a from a you know kind of environmental stewardship standpoint, water quality standpoint, even though this paper shows that ammonium sulfate worked pretty well in both places, um, I would shy away from using a straight soluble fertilizer for late fall fertilization. Um, you know, it might be okay up to about a half a pound of N at the time at a time, but 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 higher than that, I would shy away from just because the risk for Offsite mobility. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to fertilize at a higher rate in the late fall, definitely include some slow release stuff. Um, it, and when you dig into the mechanism of a polymer coated, sulfur coated urea, depending on the time of the fall, that even makes me a little bit nervous because they don't shut down completely like a polymer coated urea does. So if you apply a product with a sulfur coating in you know, November in a lot of places, I, I think there's some risk to loss there too. Now, if you want to apply that in September or October in time for it to be released and the plant to take it up, I think that's fine. But a, but a sulfur coated product, I would stay away from, from str- truly late fall fertilization. Okay. And I would be more inclined to use a straight polymer coated product than 
maybe with some soluble mixed in because we know once it gets cold enough that polymer coat is going to shut down release and it's just going to sit there over the winter and those nutrients are going to release again in the spring like the data from from pullman showed okay um and then, you know, a couple other things I'll add into that, you know, you can use polymer coatings with different longevities. And there's all kinds of ways you can take advantage of that in the fall. I mean, you can you can apply. A, we've got some data uh, that was there was a study that was done at Penn State a number of years ago. Um, and, you know, we found we can apply a, you know, a four month, 120 day polymer coated urea in September. Mm-hmm. It's still warm enough to get good fall response out of it. But then it shuts down. Um, and then all the way into May and even June, we were still seeing positive color response from a September application from a, from a long-term polymer coated urea. So, um, that, that's an incredibly powerful technology. Um, if you, if if you, if you use it right and you can be a little bit creative with it. And again, this comes back to four R's, right? Mm -hmm. Right product, right rate, right time, right place. Um, and, you know, this is this is something that we promote the golf course to say, hey, get out there and, and put down, you know, true 120 would be our product, um, you know, in September at a, at a pound and a half of N. You won't have to fertilize again until June. And, you know, you have all that time you spend cleaning up all the winter mess and everything else on golf courses. And the, and the, and, the, and maybe the soils are soft and wet and you don't want to get equipment out there. And, and, you know, if you don't have to fertilize until June, you can concentrate on all those spring projects. And it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. And, you know, you can set up a program like that. You can fertilize twice a year, fertilize in June and, and September, yeah. you know, yeah. and you're done. Th- this product was Polyon 44 and this is in 2000 something, 2004, uh, I think is yeah. when you published it. So it was, you know, I I know over the years. I mean, I, don't, I haven't been in the industry for who knows how long, but that the polymer coats have sort of, it's particularly polyon, they've gotten rid of some products like the micros, and they've changed a few tweaks here and there. I don't know if that's exactly the same polyon forty four that you would buy today, but the point is, is that it is a it is a thin back then forty four uh, was a thinner coat. Uh, it wasn't intended to last, you know, six months or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's probably like you get a little bit more release in the colder temperatures as opposed to a, you know, 120 day product applied in November that would yeah. just sit there. You know, it just wouldn't release much at all at that temperature. So, um, yeah. so keep that in mind. I, I oftentimes try to use this analogy. And maybe it's wrong and whatever. Correct me if I'm wrong. But when people and I, you have your brand and there's you know 20, 30 different brands of polymer coats. But let's say, um, well, what is your brand? I'll just use your brand since you're here. Yeah, so our brand is, is true, T T R U. Okay, so when yeah. you say true, oh, I'm gonna use true. Well, true is a brand. It's like kind of like Nike. I mean, there's a lot of different shoes in Nike, you know. True, there's a lot mm-hmm. of different re- coatings within that brand. So you need to make sure you're using the appropriate length right. product for the appropriate time and the appropriate location. If you go yeah. out with the true and you get, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, what your coating thicknesses are, but if you go out there with a you know, one year product or a six month release product and you go out in there in December and expect to see the same results as you do, well, say, let's say November and expect to see the same results with a thinner coat, you're probably going to be a little disappointed early on. You're not going to see that release until well into the summer. Right. So just be mindful. Yeah. And and I'll caution you on this too. You have to be, um, um, you, you, you have to know the product you're using is what Travis is implying but it's not even just based on 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 the analysis right Mm -hmm. because we make so so we make true in four different longevities an example all right and both the 60 day longevity and the 90 day longevity are a 44 zero zero yeah okay and 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 the reason that the that the that the analysis isn't isn't different in, in fact it is on a decimal point basis but because of rounding we claim the same because we only have to add a tiny little bit more polymer to, to, to extend that from a 60 day product to a 90 day product. And it's not enough to affect the analysis. Yep. Similarly, our, our 120, 180 day products are both 4300. Zero, zero. So my point is this, uh, when you're, when you're buying these products, um, 
you know, wh whoever you're buying it from, ask them, you know, what's in it and what's the percentage. Mm -hmm. Some people put on their label exactly what's in there. Some people don't. They're not required to. They're required to say it's a polymer coated urea. Yes. But they're not required to disclose, you know, the, the, the exact particulars of the blend of how much is each is in there. So, you know, make make sure you 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 ask them for it. A lot of times, uh, a distributor will give you the blend the blend sheet. They'll give you the recipe, and you can see exactly what's in it. Yes. Uh, and, and so that's the only way to know what you're really getting. Yeah, and I and I couldn't have said it better, Eric. Is that um, you will not know from a standard fertilizer label what um, release rate or thickness or analysis of the actual Palmer coated urea is in the blend. It'll just say Palmer coated urea. Um, so please ask your blender or distributor. And, and if the distrib well, if the distributor is like through a warehouse, they they might not actually know. I mean, depending on the the, the company, but um, the blender sure will know. And and what you're talking about is the blend. We always always refer to it as the blend sheet, where you get the tons of this and the tons of that, and it's actually the recipe for the blend. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. that, you will know exactly what it is. And so as a consumer, I I, I don't want to have more hoops to jump through but as a consumer i wish we had the blend sheet because when i go back try to reformulate blends from a label it, i can't always do it particularly when there's natural organics in there is almost impossible to do because i don't know everything that what was in there or what rate it was in there and when it comes to polymer coats i can't tell you how long it's going to last or exactly what the rate should be at this because i can't i don't know what the actual product is in there so at some point i would like to hopefully I don't want to say get the rules changed, but I mean, it only, it only helps the consumer and helps really the manufacturer and distributor. So the, the, the applicators are applying the right product at the right rate because otherwise <clears throat> they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth sometimes because, oh, your product didn't work. No, it worked. It, you just didn't apply it at the right rate. <laughs> right. Right. So. And, 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 ju and just to expand on that, I mean, specifically what, what, what Travis is talking about is if you have a product that's going to last 120 days, you need to apply that at a different rate than a product that's going to last 60 days, right? Because you're sure. feeding the turf for longer. You need to provide enough nutrients to, 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 to get you to that length. Mm -hmm. And if you misapply it at the wrong rate, um, it's not going to not going to work your expectations i'll tell you I'll give you a little anecdote here real quick before we before we sign off is that um in i came to the academia through the industry and i worked in fertilizers as, as you know eric for many many years um and we did a study down in uh fort lauderdale where i was looking at the grow in establishment from these different polymer coats and at the same time i was looking at the leaching with these different polymer coats and we weren't we weren't trying to measure the leaching from this treatment and the leaching from that we were trying to find the right combination of rate and turf response and in leaching. So at some point, the rates were so high, we're going to see in leaching. We're going to see turf response. We're going to see in leaching though. Okay. So we're going to, when we had, I had it rated down to where at some point I'm going to hit that magic number where I get the establishment I want and I have virtually no in leaching. And we found that. And when, but the whole process, some of my colleagues were like, what are you doing? You're applying polymer coat at five pounds an in. I go, yeah, I know. I was applying it at 10 pounds an in too. I mean, I was applying it at crazy high numbers because I'm trying to find that magic zone where I get what I want in terms of response with very little or negligible environmental impact. And the, in that particular case, it was a very heavily coated, very long release polymer coat at five pounds. Had the same response. This is anecdotal. I didn't publish this, but had the same response as soluble applied every week. So the point is... <clears throat> You can get done what you want to get done with some of these products, but you better know what it is you're dealing with <laughs> and, and how to do it properly. Is that yeah. fair to say, Eric? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, what you just described just all goes back to four R's, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you, you know, knowing the product, how it works, applying it at the right rate at the right time. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Dr. And, and I, think that, I think that's a great mental model to build your fertilization program around no matter what kind of turf you're fertilizing whether it's a golf course or lawns or sports fields or parks um just kind of that mental model of what's the most efficient way to do it uh for you to to get the results that you want and there's there's loads of choices out there and tons of ways to get there Definitely. and just understand all the tools in your toolbox and how to use them best to you know build a program that works best for you well said Dr. Milton, I am so happy you came on today. I hope you had a good time because you have like- I did, Travis, this was great. You have, you have oh. several other papers that I'm going to 
uh, annoy you by uh, to try to come back on and <laughs> help yeah. me go through your other papers as well. So I really yeah. appreciate your time today. Anything else yeah, you want to call any time? Happy to do it. Good. Well, thank you so much. Guys, tomorrow I have another paper. Um, some, of the, some of the people are interested in carbohydrates. So tomorrow's paper is a 74 paper. I can't remember. Uh, about carbohydrates and growth and all that stuff during uh, fall fertility of cool season grasses. So look forward to that tomorrow at 10 a.m. Until then, I really appreciate everybody coming by today. Thank you, Dr. Miltner. Really appreciate your time. I know you're busy. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. All right, guys. See you then. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.